The 2nd of April 2022, the second International Asexuality Day, marked an important date for the asexual community. The LGBTQ plus rights charity Stonewall announced they will be launching the Stonewall in collaboration with Yasmin Benoit, Ace Project, the first ever report on asexual discrimination in the UK. How important is this study? We begin our journey at the Bristol Pride March where the purple, grey, black and white were scattered in the sea of flags. The event celebrates how far LGBTQ plus rights have come and raises awareness of the areas that still need work done. Let's find out how aware locals are of asexuality and aromanticism. I think asexual means someone who isn't interested or doesn't really want to engage in like sex basically like you know physically i think it means somebody that doesn't have no uh, a romantic attraction to anyone the sort of lgbt books that i read um i understand it to be someone who it falls in love and um, enjoys relationships but just doesn't it isn't interested in the sexual side of things like okay. sex not really being a part of your life it's not really a major thing or you don't really feel it as a you know so it's not really part not not for you not for you so i think a romantic means maybe not interested in romance that's what i would assume it's the first time i've heard that 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 label so i don't know Okay, so I definitely don't know what that one means. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, it sounds a similar sort of thing, but um, but yeah, I couldn't say for sure. I think like you much prefer people on a friend's basis rather than like intimate, huggy, cuddly, anything like that. What does it mean to be asexual or aromantic? Asexual refers to someone who experiences little to no sexual attraction and aromantic is a romantic counterpart. According to a poll by Sky Data, 75% of adults in the UK are unable to define asexuality. We had the opportunity to catch model and asexual activist Yasmin Benoit over a Zoom call during the first week of the ACE project, where she told us more about the study. We are going to be producing a report into the issue of asexual discrimination in the UK, specifically when it comes to education, healthcare, and within the workplace, as those are the areas that would usually be protected under the Equality Act, but aren't really protected because the Equality Act does not recognize asexuality as being an orientation. We're going to be doing focus groups with a bunch of different ACEs around the country so that we can hear their experiences and their testimonies and use those to inform policy and legislation wide and hopefully it will give us some more insight into what ACE experiences are like in the UK. The main goal is to produce a report which will be distributed to uh, businesses and charities, organizations, politicians, um, so we can hopefully give asexuality the legal protection that all the other sexual orientations have. We'd like it to be recognized as a sexual orientation. We would like it to not be medicalized in the international classification of diseases. We'll find of what needs to be done, the more research that we do into it. But at the moment, we know that those are issues. And so we're hoping that the results of the report will hopefully be able to help make suggestions based on evidence. She also shared some examples of ace phobia. I mean, it's, you know, people making inappropriate comments in the workplace, GPs suggesting that, that there's something physically wrong with them, not wanting to give them the right treatment, thinking that they don't need certain treatment on the basis of them being asexual, workplaces, like not having it included in their DNI or um, not being protected by your employers when ace phobia comes up. And shared the impact it has on asexual mental health including high rates of depression and anxiety. Um, very similar to the wider queer community, and I think we can all put that down to like the kind of lack of understanding in our society and discrimination and needing to be in the closet, which is something that's also very common for asexual people who are more likely to be in the closet than a lot of other orientations, including in the workplace and at school. So yeah, I think it has like a damaging psychological effect on a lot of people and they don't really feel like they're protected or that there's much that can be done about it. So hopefully this project will help to set the wheel in motion. Let's put the project into context. Five ACEs share their experiences, starting with Sandra Bellamy. Education about asexuality, all things asexual, so I share my own asexual life journey in order to help you in yours. 
If you haven't already subscribed, hit that great big subscribe button right here, right now. Please hit that bell icon so you get notified of every time I go live right now or post a new video. She is an author, chat host, runs a YouTube channel, Asexualize My Asexual Life, and is the founder of Asexualize.com and Asexualize Academy. She identifies as heteroromantic, hyperromantic, and asexual with grey areas, and runs asexual meetups in Exeter. She shared how she first came across the label asexual after a traumatic event. Before I discovered I'm asexual, I thought I'm not going to be able to date again because the expectation of sex at the end of night just became too much when I was dating heterosexuals. So I saw a counsellor, but it went really badly because I told her that I didn't want sex. I just wanted to kiss and cuddle. I was worried that I wasn't going to be able to find anyone for a relationship. And she then told me I'd have to have sex in order to keep a good guy. And, you know, that is just horrifying really horrifying it's the worst thing she could have said to me because it's based to, to me it's like giving a guy a license to rape me you know it's basically saying that I can't have love without sex and that a guy can only be good to you if you have sex with him I, I really was disgusted that was an NHS counsellor but I believe everything happens for reason if I hadn't had that conversation I wouldn't have gone home and googled I love kissing but not sex and discovered I'm asexual and reminisced on one of the first asexual meetups she organised. If you haven't met any asexuals actually in person offline, it's kind of like your identity is a bit surreal. You know, it's kind of like you need to solidify it somehow. You feel kind of alone still because unless you see someone in person, it's kind of like, oh, it's all on the internet. But it's kind of like more of a thought and a feeling than an actual embodiment, if you know what I mean. I don't know how to explain it. Particularly for me, I, I felt like I needed to, to actually solidify it in person. I um, specifically wanted to meet up with asexuals, so I, it would bring it to reality more for me. That's what I'm trying to say. And so that it did exactly that. So... Um, I wanted to meet some asexuals. No, it's definitely, I know it's real anyway, because I am asexual, but it, it makes it all the more real when you see some people in person. And I wanted to meet real life asexuals so that I would be able to chat to them in person and see how different it was in contrast to, for example, heterosexuals that have been around all my life pretty much. So yeah, so I went and had this meet up. Uh, we went to Nando's, there's only two of us, but they met me outside my work. And I had the most amazing time. Usually I don't get on so well with women, I get on better with blokes, but the two girls that I went with were absolutely amazing. We're all laughing and joking. We actually did make some sex jokes, which is quite weird for asexuals. But, um, but we all had a great time and we were all talking about asexuality. And it was just amazing to be able to connect with people who are like minded, you know, and to give you that sense of community. Back at Bristol Pride, we met Molly, a teacher who identifies in the asexual spectrum and runs inclusion works for young LGBTQ plus people. I think so many people think it makes you like not a proper adult because you're not just thinking about sex and when you're trying to date people you're not really bothered about the sex part of it and sometimes it can make you feel like quite naive and quite young I think that's just not fair and you, there's so much of media is focused on sex and sexuality and I think like romantic attraction is still nice and perfectly adult and discuss the lack of asexual representation in the media I mean so I don't really know like what studies are happening like I know I know very little about it because in the media there's there's very little discussion of it and it's always you know pride is just about like the the sexual side of pride is really important because it's been so kind of discriminated against so long it's really valid but ace people still belong and in the in the spectrum and I think maybe more could be done to include us pride march is not the only place where lgbtq plus activism takes place it continues online Hello, my name is Daniel and I identify as homoromantic asexual. Today we're going to be Daniel is an optical engineer and asexual activist who runs a YouTube channel Slice of Ace. His cat joined him during the Zoom call whilst he shared his ace journey with us. I think I came out as homoromantic ace about about five years ago maybe, um, while I was at university. I think if I had thought about my identity uh, for any length of time, I would have realised it. Quite, that I, at least that I was ace quite young but I didn't really care about it and it wasn't until I got to university and I was like hmm well I still haven't really wanted sex and everyone else seems to want sex all the time so maybe I should just check into it in case there's, any, there's anything wrong and when I did I just found out about asexuality 
and learning about asexuality helped me then discover my homo homo romanticism because the gay culture especially gay male culture is very heavily sexual i think there's a good reason for that because that sexuality is what has been suppressed by society over the years but for someone like me who doesn't feel sexual attraction it can make it difficult to relate to a what is portrayed as a gay male experience so i hadn't considered the fact that i could have attraction towards men despite not feeling sexual attraction and talked about the need for intersectionality in the media and there's a lot of ground to be broken still in terms of intersectional representation of identities but also taking other aspects of yourself and then in conjunction with your identity so things like race and religion and just the culture you grew up in affecting how you identify and those experiences need to be talked about and and shown in the media more we also had the chance to talk with reese who we met through the aromantic spectrum union for recognition education and advocacy. Rees is a social science student based in India and discussed their identity with us over a Zoom call. I use the term ero is flux so that means my ace identity it usually fluctuates on the spectrum so it could be sex in different sex in repulse or even gay sexual at times whereas my aromantic identity it usually stays constant and to be more specific i would say i'm like a romance indifferent ero rees also shared how they first came across a romanticism in india marriage is everything once a person is of age like say above 22 the person has to get married and that is their life so marriage is of lot of importance so the teacher i had she was probably in her 50s or 60s like bordering 60s and she was like i am not going to get married and i don't surely need a man to depend like to so to depend on and i am perfectly capable of being self sufficient and um, like just being myself my whole life okay and i was like oh wow this is interesting i'm going to be like her <laughs> and that is i guess one of the first introductions to how you don't really need marriage in life to be fed this hedge of material in childhood i am going to revolt against it and that is probably one of the first introductions to what aromanticism was there's one last stop in our journey We met with Leo who identifies as asexual and demiromantic at the university canteen. So one of the things that people ask when I tell them I'm asexual is they tend to ask some quite personal questions about like my sexual history and like whether I masturbate or not and I would just like to say don't do that it's not something it's okay to ask and it's not really relevant and the other thing i think is that when you're talking about asexuality a lot you need to really differentiate between three things those being sexual attraction i.e. you know the want to like do sexual acts with someone um romantic attraction the want to pursue a romantic engagement with someone and libido which is i guess your body's like natural desire to like do sexual acts i feel like they're conflated a lot because most people don't really think of them about them as separate things you know because there's the standard structure is you find one person who you're attracted to sexually and attracted to romantically and then you pursue a relationship with them and you're like one source of like you know uh sexual activity and so they're all kind of they're not thought of as separate but they are separate right like you know you can be romantically attracted to someone and not feel sexually attracted to them there's no reason why you shouldn't and you know you can have a high libido but not really want to have sex with anyone in particular and i think once you understand those as separate concepts you're a reasonably far way along the course of like understanding asexuality and aromanticism from the accounts we heard it's clear that it's important to research and bring more awareness to the misconceptions and discrimination that the asexual and aromantic communities face the stonewall in collaboration with yasmin benoit ace project was an overdue study of the community and the struggles they face The findings which will be released later this year will hopefully help inform policies and improve the lived experiences of asexuals.